Good afternoon. Or, good morning. <laughs> A little confused on my time today. It's daylight saving drop back time. So anyway, um, during the late 1940s and early 1950s, Dr. Jung had a decade-long conversation with Father Victor White. And Father White was a very important individual for Dr. Jung's oeuvre because he confirmed many of the things that Dr. Jung was discovering and writing about in this period of time, including uh, his book, Ion, and many others. And Dr. White had, uh, or Father White, he was a doctor also, but Father White uh, was a professor of dogmatic theology at the Black Far um, he was professor of dogmatic theology at Dominican House of Studies Blackfriars at Oxford University and in 1940 he had a midlife crisis and he came to a Jungian analyst for help with his crisis, and therefore he was introduced to the work of Dr. Jung. Unfortunately, he couldn't do much about it during World War II. This was 1940, but in 1945, he wrote to Dr. Jung and sent him some of his pamphlets that he had written about Dr. Jung's work. Hi, Miles. Nice to see you here. Sorry, sorry you haven't had your breakfast yet. <laughs> it's 20 to 9. You're a late riser. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, this is going to be a short letter, but it's uh, four pages long. And one of the important things in this is a quote that Dr. Jung put into this letter, or I'm sorry, um, is a quote that Dr. Jung put in a letter dated October 5th, 1945. And in that quote, he reveals to Father White <clears throat> his ultimate goal. And so I want to read that to you, and it's here on your screen as well. I'm quoting from a paper by Joseph W. Rutte, R-U-T-T-E, -E, The White Young Friendship, The Untold Story. And I'm on page 301 of that book. And in one of the paragraphs, he says, Jung also makes clear what his ultimate goal is and how difficult it will be to achieve. It is of the highest importance that the educated and enlightened public should know religious truth as a thing living in the human soul and not as an abstruse and unreasonable relic of the past. Understanding begins with the individual mind, and this means psychology. It is a gigantic task, indeed, to create a new approach to an old truth. Now, obviously, that's true, and at this point in time, 1945, Dr. Jung was very worried about the idea that Friedrich Nietzsche had put forth at the end of the 19th century in Thus Spake Zarathustra, where he said that God is dead. And Dr. Jung's work essentially says that God is alive. He's just not where the theologians say he is. In other words, he's not, he's not up there. He's in here. And in the human psyche. 
And so over this period of 10 years, there's a very long uh, correspondence between these two men. But over the course of 10 years, they wrote many letters back and forth. And two of them appear in this book, The New God Image by Dr. Edward Edinger. And Dr. Edinger's book is, 14, is a commentary on 14 letters that Dr. Young wrote over a the course of his career, which set forth what the God image is. And by the God image, Dr. Jung was talking about something in the deep unconscious of the human species. He was not talking about the metaphysical God. And so there was a long discussion, and I'll get to that at a later reading, but there's a long discussion about that issue because Dr. Jung always claimed that he wasn't talking about the metaphysical God. He was talking about the God as we perceive him. And by we, I mean all humanity, because all religions are based on this God image, which is also called the self in Jungian psychology. So I'm going to read this letter now, and then hopefully later today, I will read a second letter to Dr. White, which appears in the same book. To Father Victor White, 24 November, 1953. Dear Victor, Forget for once dogmatics and listen to what psychology has to say concerning your problem. Christ as a symbol is far from being invalid, although he is one-sided of the self and the devil the other. This pair of opposites is contained in the creator as his right and left hand, as Clemens Romanus says. From the psychology... From the psychological standpoint, the experience of God, the Creator, is the perception of an overpowering impulse issuing from the sphere of the unconscious. We don't know whether this influence or compulsion deserves to be called good or evil, although we cannot prevent ourselves from welcoming or cursing it, giving it a bad or a good name according to our subjective condition. Thus, Yahweh has either aspect, because he is essentially the creator, primus motor, and because he is yet unreflected in his whole nature. With the incarnation, the picture changes completely, as it means that God becomes manifest in the form of man, who is conscious and therefore cannot avoid judgment. He simply has to call the one good and the other evil. It is a historical fact that the real devil only came into existence together with Christ. Though Christ was God, as man, he was detached from God, and, the wa and he watched the devil falling out of heaven. Remove... <clears throat> Though Christ was God, as man he was detached from God, and he watched the devil falling out of heaven, removed from God, as he, Christ, was separated from God inasmuch as he was human. In his utter helplessness on the cross, he even confessed that God had forsaken him. The Dios Pater would leave him in... The Deus Pater would leave him to his fate as he always strafes, as he always strafes those whom he has filled before with his abundance by breaking his promise. This is exactly what Saint This is exactly what Saint Johannes uh, Crucia describes as the dark night of the soul. It is the reign of darkness, which is also God, but an, but an ordeal for man. 
the Godhead has a double aspect. And as Meister Ecker says, God is not blissful in his mere Godhead, and that is the reason for his incarnation. But becoming man, he becomes at the same time a definite being, which is this and not that. Thus, the very first thing Christ must do is to sever himself from his shadow and call it the devil. Sorry, but the Gnostics of Iranius already knew it. When a patient in our days is about to emerge from an unconscious condition, he is instantly confronted with his shadow, and he has to decide for the good, otherwise he goes down the drain. Nolan's involuntarily, involuntarily he imitates Christ and follows his example. The first step on the way to individuation consists in the discrimination between himself and the shadow. In this stage, the good is the goal of individuation, and consequently, Christ represents the self. The next step is the problem of the shadow. In dealing with darkness, you have got to cling to the good, otherwise the devil devours you. You need every bit of your goodness in dealing with evil, and just there. To keep the light alive in the darkness, that's the point, and only there your candle makes sense. Now tell me how many people you know who can say with any truthfulness that they have finished their dealings with the devil and consequently can chuck the Christian symbol overboard. As a matter of fact, our society has not even begun to face its shadow or to develop those Christian virtues so badly needed in dealing with the powers of darkness. Our society cannot afford the luxury of cutting itself loose from the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ, even if it should know that the conflict with the shadow, i.e. Christ versus Satan, is only the first step on the way to the faraway goal of the unity of the self in God. It is true, however, that the imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ, leads you into your own very real and Christ-like conflict with darkness. And the more you are engaged in this war and in these attempts at peacemaking, helped by the anima, the more you begin to look forward beyond the Christian eon to the oneness of the Holy Spirit. He is the he is the pneumatic state that he is the pneumatic state the creator attains to he is the pneumatic state the creator attains to through the phase of incarnation he is the experience of every individual that has undergone the complete abolition of his ego through the absolute opposition expressed by the symbol Christ versus Satan the state of the Holy Spirit means a restitution of the original oneness of the unconscious on the level of consciousness. This is alluded to, as I see it, by Christ's logion, ye are gods. This state is not quite understandable yet. It is a mere anticipation. The later development from the Christian eon to the one of St. Spiritus has been called the Evangelium Eternum by Joaquin de Fiora, by, by what? <laughs> Dr. Jung uses uh, this name both in uh, Latin and here in Italian, so I will give you the Italian, by Joaquino da Fiori, in a time when the great tearing apart had just begun. Such vision seems to be granted by divine grace as a sort of consolation, 
so that man is not left in a completely hopeless state during the time of darkness. We are actually in this state of darkness viewed from the standpoint of history. We are still within the Christian eon and just beginning to realize the age of darkness where we shall need Christian virtues to the utmost. In such a state, we could not possibly dismiss Christ as an invalid symbol, although we clearly foresee the approach of his opposite. Yet we don't see and feel the latter as the preliminary step toward the future union of the divine opposites, but rather as a menace against everything that is good, beautiful, and holy to us. The Adventus Diaboli, the, the advent of the diabolic, does not invalidate the Christian symbol of the self. On the contrary, it complements it. It is a mysterious transmutation of both. Since we are living in a society that is unconscious of this development and far from understanding the importance of the Christian symbol, we are called upon to hinder its invalidation, although some of us are granted the vision of a future development. But none of us could safely say that he has accomplished the assimilation and integration of the shadow. Since the Christian church is the community of all those having surrendered to the principle of the imitation of Christ, this institution, i.e. such a mental attitude, is to be maintained until it is clearly understood what the assimilation of the shadow means. Those that foresee must, as it were, stay behind their vision in order to help and to teach, particularly so if they belong to the church as her appointed servants. You should not mind if some of your analysands are helped out of the church. It is their destiny and adventure. Others will stay in anyhow. It does not matter whether the ecclesiastical powers that be approve of your vision or not. When the time is fulfilled, a new orientation will irresistibly break through, as one has seen in the case of Conceptio Immaculata and the Assumptio, which both deviate from the time-hallowed principle of apostolic authority, a thing unheard of before. It would be a lack of responsibility and rather autoerotic attitude if we were to deprive if we were to deprive our fellow beings of a vitally necessary symbol before they had a reasonable chance to understand it thoroughly, and all this because it is not complete if envisaged from an anticipated stage, we ourselves in our individual lives have not yet made real. Anybody going ahead is alone or thinks he is lonely at times, no matter whether he is the church or in the world. No matter whether he is in the church or in the world. Your practical work as director de conscience as director of conscience, your practical work as director of conscience brings to you individuals having something in their character that corresponds with certain aspects of your personality, like the many men fitting themselves as stone, like the many men fitting themselves as stones into the edifice of the tower of the shepherd of Hermas. Whatever your ultimate decision will be, you ought to realize beforehand that staying in the church makes sense as it is important to make people understand that the symbol of Christ, what the symbol of Christ means, and such understanding is indispensable to any further development. There is no way around it. As little as we eliminate from our life, There is no way round it, as little as we eliminate from our life old age, illness, and death, or Buddha's Nidhana chain of evils. The last majority 
the vast majority of people are still in such an unconscious state that one should almost protect them from the full shock of the real imitatio Christi, the real imitation of Christ. Moreover, we are still in a Moreover, we are still in the Christian eon, threatened with the complete annihilation of our world. As there, as there are not only the many, but also the few, somebody is entrusted with the task of looking ahead and talking of the things to be. That is partially my job, but I have to be very careful not to destroy the things that are. Nobody will be so foolish as to destroy the foundations when he is adding an upper story to his house. And how can he build it? And how can he build it really if the foundations are not yet properly laid? Thus, making the statement that Christ is not a complete symbol of the self, I cannot make it complete by abolishing it. I must keep, I must keep therefore, in order to build up the symbol of the perf in order to build up the symbol of the perfect contradiction in God by adding this darkness to the lumen de lumine, the true light. Thus I am approaching the end of the Christian eon, and I am to take up Joaquin's and I am to take up Joaquin's anticipation and Christ's prediction of the coming of the paraclete. This archetypal drama is at the same time exquisitely psychological and historical. We are actually living in the time of the splitting of the world and of the invalidation of Christ. But an anticipation of a faraway future is no way out of the actual situation. It is a mere consolation for those despairing at the atrocious possibilities of the present time. Christ is still the valid symbol. Only God himself can invalidate him through the paraclete. Now that is all I can say. It is a long letter and I am tired. If it is not helpful to you, it shows at least what I think. I have seen X. She. I have seen X. She is as right as she can be and as she usually is, and just as wrong as her nature permits, altogether as hopeful as a historical temperament ever can be. You have probably heard of the little celebration we had here round the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Codex given to the Institute by a generous donor. There was even a note in the Times. It was a disproportionate affair and neither my doing nor liking, but I was maneuvered into saying in the end a few words about the relation between Gnosticism and psychology. My best wishes, yours, cold, yours cordially, C.G. So there are a number of footnotes here, which I think I should read to you and provide you with a little bit of context. Um, Dr. Jung was responding to a letter from Victor White. Footnote one, in a letter of 8 November, 1953, White said that Jung seemed to create a dilemma by maintaining that Christ is no longer an adequate and valid symbol of the self, a misunderstanding which Jung tries to correct here. Most of this letter is published in German. And let me see if I can find the reference here. Okay, I'll try to read the words um, that are actually in the letter with the footnote. It 
So there's one footnote that says this pair of opposites is contained in the creator as his right and left hand, as Clemens Romanus says, and that's footnote two. And Clemens Romanus was a theologian in the first millennium of the Christian era. Then Dr. Jung says, from the psychological standpoint, the experience of God, the creator, is the perception of an overwhelming impulse issuing from the sphere of the unconscious. And his footnote from Psychology and Religion, Collected Works 11, paragraph 137, it is always the overwhelming psychological it is always the overwhelming psychic factor that is called God. And then, let's see, what's the next one? So Dr. Jung made the statement, it is a historical fact that the real devil only came into existence together with Christ. And the footnote reads, Jung was, of course, perfectly aware of the fact that the figure of Satan occurs in the Old Testament. What he means is that Christ, being the incarnation of God's goodness, the devil becomes a psychological inevitability as the incarnation of evil. In other words, the devil is the personification of Christ's split-off dark side. He says this in Ion, Collected Works 9-2, paragraph 113. And then he says, Though Christ was God, as man he was detached from God, and he watched the devil falling out of heaven. The footnote reads, Luke 10-18. Then he refers to Meister Eckhart. God is not blissful in his mere Godhead, and that is the reason for his incarnation. The footnote is from Psychological Types, Collected Work 6, paragraph 418. And this next quote, okay. He's talking about Christ saying, ye are gods. And that comes from John 10, 34, referring to Psalm 82, 6. And then he's referring to Joaquin de Flora, Joaquim of Flora, um, who lived, and the footnote says, uh, about 1145 to 1202. He was an Italian mystic and theologian. He taught that there are three periods of world history, the age of the law, or of the father, the age of the gospel, or of the son, and the age of the Holy Spirit, or of contemplation. His teachings were condemned by the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215. And this is referred to in Ion, paragraph 137 and following. Now keep in mind what one of the major things that Dr. Jung was saying from a religious standpoint is that the Holy Spirit appears in all human beings and that is what Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what Christ meant when he said, ye are gods. <clears throat> and so, let's see here.
okay, on page 149, when the time is fulfilled, a new orientation will irresistibly break through, as one has seen in the case of Conceptio Immaculata, and that is from the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, pronounced as of faith by Pius the Ninth in the bull Ineffabilis Deus, 1854. And the Assumptio, which both deviate from the time-hallowed principle of apostolic authority. And the footnote is, the principle by which all of the apostles were supposed to have taught was regarded as infallible, and by which nothing in religious teaching or practice was considered Christian unless it was of apostolic origin. Okay. And then he refers to, like many men fitting themselves as stones into the edifice of the tower in the shepherd of Hermas. Footnote is an early Christian text described to Hermas, brother of Pope Pius I, about 140 to 155 AD, containing lessons to be disseminated for the instruction of the church. It's discussed in Psychological Types, Collected Works 6, paragraphs 381 and following, especially paragraph 390 for the building of the tower. And I do know because I got it myself, uh, The Shepherd of Hermas is available on Amazon and Audible. If you would like to read it, it's quite an interesting text. Then he says, there is no way round it, as little as we can eliminate from our life, old age, illness, and death, or Buddha's Nidana chain of evils. And in footnote, he says, the 12 Nidanas of Buddhism, starting with ignorance and, rending, and ending with despair, form the Nidana chain, the conditions which keep man a prisoner in samsara the endless chain of rebirth. In Jung's collected works, Nidana is spelled two different ways. I don't think that's very important, but anyway, it's footnoted. And um, then he says, um, thus making the statement that Christ is not a complete symbol of the self, I cannot make it complete by abolishing it. I must keep it, therefore, in order to build up the symbol of the perfect contradiction in God by adding this darkness to the true light. And that comes from the Council of Nicaea 325, defining, uh, defined the everlasting word, the true light, John 1, 9, as Lumen de Lumin, light of the light. And then he's referring to um, the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Codex, which is later called the Jung Codex. Um, and the footnote reads, a Gnostic papyrus in Coptic found in 1945 near the village of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt and acquired in 1952 for the C.G. Jung Institute. It is now known as the Codex Jung. Its main part consists of the so-called Gospel of Truth attributed to Valentinus. This has been published under the editorship of M. Malanine, blah, blah, And there's one part of it that is still un unpublished, but there are several parts of it that have been published. 
and um, and Jung gave uh, an address about the Nag Hammadi Gnostic Codex upon its being gifted to the C.G. Jung Institute. And I've made a copy of that address and intend to read it in within the next few days. And then there's this further footnote. White answered in a short note on 20 November 1953, saying how immensely grateful he was for the letter, adding, the points that ring the bell most immediately are those about the autoerotic attitude and about an anticipation of a faraway future is no way out. Okay, so that completes my reading. I will look at your comments here and see if there's anything I can say about them. What's happened? Okay, so Miles has made a number of comments here, as has Jesse Saucedo, and so let me look. Um, Jesse says, ah, I had a mystical experience not lo that long ago, bypassing the paradigm that construction, my, that construction, my personality structure, the awareness consciousness is God incarnated in physical form. I think that Dr. Jung would agree with that. The Christ is the aspect of the creator conscious, he, she, whatever conceptual identification the awareness claims is an aspect of the creator, yes. And then Miles says, I was helped out of the church of bricks and mortar to an adventure that has led me to identifying as an aspiring child of love. So now I also say I am not a Christian because it suits me. Miles says, I have another mother archetypal from the animal kingdom, a, apparently a teddy bear I will share with you soon, Scott. And then he says, I was with an ecumenical group Friday evening and Saturday. All they did was nibble around the edges. <laughs> World Religions Conference in Toronto this week. They said at the outset they are all unique and not interested in oneness. Well, um, good luck with that. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, okay, so uh, I have another commitment just now, which I need to move on to, but I will come back hopefully this afternoon and read this second letter to Victor White. And thank you for joining me today. And I will be uh, editing this video. I may make it available in its raw form uh, for a period of time, just so that the information can get out into the public. And later I will edit it. So thank you for joining me this afternoon. And I am going to discontinue until about four o'clock Eastern U.S. time today. Thank you for joining me today.